Coming up on Eyewitness News, an ammonia leak in Burlington is posing a potential danger. Meanwhile, an investigation is centered around Senator Jesse Helms, and the General Assembly inches closer to approving the Safe Roads Bill. Good evening, everyone. I'm Larry Stogner. Beverly Burke is on vacation. Those stories and more in a minute on Eyewitness News. Lee, the great fitting jeans. Lee Jeans, the brand that fits. The final test for a grocery store comes at the cash register. Having the freshest vegetables doesn't mean much if they cost more. Heavy western grain fed beef is just a lot of baloney if the price is a bum steer. And even though we've gained a lot of customers by offering the best in quality, it's our 6,800 low prices at the cash register that keep people coming back. Food line. Our low prices are guaranteed to register a smile. EX. EX. 11 together. WTVD. Serving the heart of Carolina, this is Eyewitness News, the fastest growing news in North Carolina. Good evening, everyone. I'm Larry Stogner. Big problems in downtown Burlington this evening. A liquid ammonia leak has forced police there to evacuate several city blocks. Eyewitness News reporter Marie Ryan has just returned from the scene and has this report. You couldn't see the fumes coming from this vacant warehouse in downtown Burlington, but you could smell the ammonia. About 1 o'clock, construction workers accidentally ruptured a pipe, which was connected to a 150-gallon tank of liquid ammonia. Toxic fumes quickly filled the warehouse and the air outside of the building. Upon arriving on the scene, Burlington firefighters began evacuating a five-block area around the building, mostly small businesses and a couple of big manufacturing plants. We estimate with the businesses, the industrial plants, and the residential areas that have been evacuated, we're talking probably between 800,000 people. When will they be allowed to come back? Just as quickly as we feel like they're safe. Fire Chief John Love doesn't think anyone breathed enough of the fumes to have permanent lung damage. But with the vapors from liquid ammonia, if you breathe a strong enough concentration for long enough, it can prove fatal. Roadblocks kept reporters and onlookers back while firefighters used a hose to let the ammonia leak out onto the street. The liquid was then immediately diluted with water to neutralize any danger. Fire officials say it could be hours before all of the 150 gallons of ammonia are drained out. Until that's done, no one will be let back into the area. In Burlington, Marie Ryan, Eyewitness News 11. A big story out of Washington this evening. Senator Jesse Helms may be under investigation by a House subcommittee following reports that he tried to exert political influence on a tobacco decision. More on that story from Mary Kaufman of our Washington Bureau. Ways and Means Subcommittee investigation was prompted by press reports that Senator Helms had written a series of personal letters to Treasury Secretary Donald Regan asking for quick action on the scrap tobacco tariff issue. In those letters, Helms stressed the political climate back home as the reason he needed help. In one letter, he mentioned that his political adversaries were out to get him. In the last line of his letter, Helms underlined, I need your help, Don. In another, Helms pleaded, this is of paramount importance to me and the GOP in North Carolina. When the story of the letters broke last week, Helms summoned reporters for interviews. He denied that he was asking for a political decision from the Reagan administration, but acknowledged his concern about the Senate race next year. Well, I threw that in as an extra. The letter is one of about 25 I've written to the Secretary and others <clears throat> on the scrap tobacco question. But I wanted to get his attention, and I did need his help on behalf of the tobacco farmers of North Carolina. Helms was not available for an interview today, but an aide quoted him as saying he was not worried about the pending investigation. Helms accused the Democratic chairman of the subcommittee of just playing politics with tobacco again. Meanwhile, a subcommittee staff member bristling about today's press reports emphasized that the hearing is not an investigation of Senator Helms. In fact, the senator will not even be asked to testify. Instead, the hearing will focus on whether the Customs Service plays politics when it makes decisions. Mary Kaufman, Eyewitness News 11, Washington. We weren't able to catch up with Senator Helms, who is on vacation, but our Hope Robertson did catch up with Senator John East to ask about that Helms letter. East told her the letter was merely an attempt to correct an import situation that's hurting the tobacco industry. So when someone attempts to use his, quote, 
political office or public office to see that that is corrected and done fairly and properly and adequately, I do not see what is improper about that. East made those remarks during a tour of Seymour Johnson Air Force Base. There's yet another investigation going on in the Fayetteville Police Department, the fourth probe to surface in the last month. The Fayetteville Times reports the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission is looking into charges of race and sex discrimination inside the department. Another investigation stems from complaints from a group of policemen who say department rules and policies are being violated. The murder trial of accused IBM killer Leonard Avery is still mired in pretrial motions in Durham County Superior Court. Not one witness has taken the stand, not one juror has been seated. Eyewitness newsman Jim Rosenfield reports Avery's attorneys are asking for a lot and getting very little. Superior Court Judge Thomas Lee denied virtually all the pretrial motions entered by the defense with one exception. Lee ruled the makeup of the grand jury, which handed down the 14 indictments against Leonard Avery, did not underrepresent blacks, and so the indictments stand. He also denied four other motions, including one asking that two juries be seated, one to decide guilt or innocence, and one, if necessary, to decide the sentence. Avery could get the death penalty for his alleged crimes. The 30-year-old former IBM worker sat passively throughout the day, saying nothing. Nothing. During a recess, defense attorney Thomas Laughlin appeared optimistic despite the denials. I think the most important motion from a trial standpoint that the judge ruled on was allowing our motion to select the jurors individually. And I think that is critical in getting a jury that will be open-minded and fair. Late this afternoon, the defense's attempts to put off the start of jury selection until Monday were also denied. So that process should get underway tomorrow afternoon. That, after Mr. Laughlin spends tomorrow morning presenting new evidence from psychological tests which were conducted on Leonard Avery this week. Evidence which Laughlin says may show his client is not competent to stand trial. In Durham, Jim Rosenfield, Eyewitness News 11. Raleigh police say the man they've arrested for a series of break-ins will probably face at least two more charges this week. Donald Hamilton Hill is being held in connection with three first-degree burglaries in North Raleigh, and he may be charged with two more. Hill was arrested following more than 30 burglaries and attempted burglaries in the Summerfield North subdivision. Following months of legislative haggling, a new drunk driving law is about to be passed in North Carolina. It won't be enforced until October, but it may go on the books as early as tomorrow. Jim Chagru was there when lawmakers finally broke through the log jam this afternoon. From the beginning today, it was obvious that House and Senate Conference Committee members were ready to move ahead on the Safe Roads Act. Do me in favor of that motion say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. 15A is adopted. After two months of stalling, one issue after another was resolved just like that, by unanimous vote. The skids were obviously greased. But there was still sharp division among Senate conferees on a proposal authored by Senator George Marion an amendment to outlaw open beer and wine containers in cars. The deciding vote was finally cast by Senate Chairman Henson Barnes. The chair in the interest of the bill will vote aye. The Senate will receive from our position in regards to uh, the beer amendment. And so the committee decided it will still be legal for passengers to drink and ride, but the driver can not drink and drive. After the vote, Marion said the amendment was defeated because Governor Jim Hunt failed to support him. I want to be honest and fair with you. I think that he has clout in this House and this Senate. And uh, I think that uh, had he gotten more involved, that uh, the amendment could have been passed. So the House and Senate versions of the Safe Roads Act finally agree. They'll be merged together and typed tonight. Final approval could come as early as tomorrow. Once these bills actually become law, the penalty for drunk driving in North Carolina is going to be a lot stiffer. Anyone who's tested and charged with driving while impaired will recognize the changes immediately. For one thing, they'll be put behind bars, possibly for as long as a day, and they'll immediately lose their license for 10 days. After conviction, the driver's license is lost again. A minimum period is one year, second offense four years, and a third conviction could mean permanent revocation. Active jail terms are likely. The new law will also allow lawsuits against taverns and stores for damages caused by sales to minors. So the law approved by this committee has teeth. But the committee and the governor will have to wait to see if it takes a bite out of the drunk driving problem. In Raleigh, Jim Chagru, Eyewitness News 11. Coming up on Eyewitness News at 6, the federal jobs bill may not be what you think it is. And we'll continue our special series on unemployment. Stay with us. When the bug alarm goes off in your vegetable garden... White flies, beetles, aphids, stop them. 
with ready-to-use ortho, tomato, and vegetable insect killer. There's no mixing needed with this handy trigger bottle. It kills major vegetable insects conveniently, economically, and you can spray right up to harvest. So when your bug alarm goes off, kill those bugs with ready-to-use ortho, tomato, and vegetable insect killer. It's easy with ortho. At Big Star, when you see the dot, you save a lot. Get whole sirloin tips. Just $1.58 a pound. Pre-basted young turkeys. Only 58 cents a pound. Big Star has Hickory Mountain whole country ham. Just $1.48 a pound. An Old Town fresh pork sausage or Holly Farms Franks and sliced bologna. Your choice, 88 cents a pound. At Big Star, when you see the dot, you save a lot. That $13 million from the federal job stimulus bill may not provide that many jobs in North Carolina after all. State officials are expected to announce how much money each county will get later this week. But anyone who thinks the money means instant, instant jobs is wrong. Officials say the bill will go do more to indirectly provide work by stimulating the economy through providing additional services. Of course, that comes as bad news for the jobless in our state who may have been hoping for employment under the bill. What's more, the rise in high technology may also be forcing out those who are currently in the workforce. A prime example of that exists in Harnett County, where automation is taking over the textile business. And in our continual special report on unemployment, Miriam Thomas examines that problem. Making a living in Harnett County has for years meant making textiles. It's a living for 40% of the people here. Burlington Industries, the largest single employer, has a workforce of 1,600. Related industries like apparel plants provide another 1,400 jobs. While Harnett County's unemployment rate is high, about 11%, the statewide decline in textile making has not been at its worst here. As new and different industries move in, textiles remain big business in this county. As machines do more of what men and women used to, production is up, automation is in, and the low-skilled worker is on the way out. Until a few years ago, the average worker in Harnett County had no place to turn to keep up with technology or just to keep a job when a plant closed down or cut back. Well, now that worker has the Harnett County Industrial Education Center. It's a one-room schoolhouse with two main goals, training people for jobs in new industry and attracting new industry with the promise of skilled workers. Because a person is economically disadvantaged does not mean that uh, the person cannot be trained for, the, for your higher, higher paying jobs. Industry, especially diversified industry, will locate an area where there are people. In addition to it, to make it more attractive, of course, you have to again develop your talents, uh, your skills, and have an available workforce. Trainees like Alex Wilcox want to be available when opportunity knocks. I feel that this is a good field to get into and um, with the economy the way it is, you will always need uh, production type workers. For Ben Lewis, it's a matter of upgrading skills so he can keep a job. I've been working with a plant here in Dunn for approximately four years and when the layoffs came, when the economy fell, uh, my supervisor suggested to me that if I had better my education, that I would have job security. Retired military man Joe Chamberlain finds it tough to re-enter a young job market with newer industries. I figured uh, if I go ahead and go to get a tool and die certificate, then eventually I'll, there's no uh, limit to the number of job possibilities. A lot more workers here will find they need new training because job growth predictions say permanent losses in the textile industry will never be revived. In Harnett County, Miriam Thomas, Eyewitness News 11. Next in sight, will the Vietnam veteran statue find a home? We'll find out in just a moment, and Tom Rector is here for Andy Park, who's a little bit under the weather tonight. But not far under. I think he just took a breather because he worked all weekend while I was sailing on the Chesapeake for a while. <laughs> It was my break, and now we'll give him his. The afternoon rain was rather welcome in the southeastern part of the state. They needed a little rain down there, and it wasn't too bad for us either. Temperatures last night, uh, 60 to low, very close to normal. On the cool side today at 70 for a high, and uh, we'll be cool again tomorrow. Only a little short of a tenth of an inch of rain at the Raleigh-Durham Airport, a little heavier in the east. Outside now, we're 67 degrees. Humidity is lower than it was earlier. It's on its way down. The barometer's coming back up. Northwesterly winds are in, and with it, the clear sky. I've got the forecast. That's up next.
Every year, millions of drivers suffer the agony of hillophobia. The fear of stopping on hills with a stick shift, with cars behind you, very close behind you. The only known cure, the ingenious hill holder clutch from Subaru. Now you don't have to go downhill until you want to. Come and taste the ribs, the devils, my friend. Just open your mouth, let them right in. Beef ribs and pork ribs and ribs that are prime. Big, thick, and juicy every time. Come to a place with its own color page. Come and get a taste of Darrow. Come and get a taste of Darrow. Your husband's been grocery shopping? Yeah, I'm afraid to look. <laughs> Relax, he shopped at Winn-Dixie and he saved money. This U.S. Choice whole untrimmed boneless sirloin tip was only $1.58 a pound. Terrific! He paid $1.49 for 49-ounce fab. This WD baking hen was priced right at 39 cents a pound. And he picked up thrifty made ice milk for 88 cents. That's great! Winn-Dixie! Now, more than ever. We're right for you! There's a feeling that's been growing in this country that we love. It's the spirit of our people. It's the drive to rise above. Don't worry, America. You've got the gusto now. Have a schlitz, America. You've got the gusto now. Here's to the guys who are making America great from the guys who make schlitz a great American beer. Have a schlitz, America. You've got the gusto now. The National Hurricane season, this year's season, 1983, begins this year, and these are the names we'll see on the list, starting with Alicia and Barry and running all the way to the end. We average about 10 storms will form in the Atlantic during this hurricane season, and about six of them will make hurricane strength, but only two will reach the United States. So the odds are very well on our side that we're not going to get to the end of this list. So, uh, Wendy, we hope we don't get that far down. But we'll watch the season as it lasts six months all the way into November. But for now, the national map shows us we're going to have a whole lot better weather now that we've gotten this rainy area off the east coast of the United States. It's off and gone, this little low formed, and it's now out off to sea. And we see that sunshine coming in. Here's the big high, dome high of high pressure coming in, bringing 40s into the Great Lakes. Behind me, we see the next weather system that will affect our weekend forming now just about Las Vegas for the center, and it's going to go across the Rockies, wind up in Nebraska tomorrow, unfortunately, to bring some more rain to Utah, mudslide country. They don't need any more of that rain out there. The radar earlier, uh, let's do the satellite photo. We can show you where the cloudiness on the east coast is now. Most of it, this is the frontal zone itself, running through Virginia, down covering just the eastern half of our state, and there's that beautiful clearing in the west, that sunshine into the triangle now, and you people in the eastern half of the state, you'll see that sun very soon as this clouds continues to move off of the coast. Now we'll see that radar, and it's mostly in the east. Earlier today, we saw a lot of rain through the center of the state. Now, this was taken at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, but now, as we look at WeatherWatch 11's live radar, it's all gone. It's gone off to the east, and we only see a few little spots way down along the lower coastline. A couple of big, heavy thunderstorms left up beyond radar range up in Pamlico Sound right now, but they're on their way out, going that away into the ocean. Mountain forecast will show us it's going to be a little bit better all the way across the state tomorrow. Becoming clear tonight, it is already clear. Tomorrow, a fair day, up to 75, a crystal day for the mountains. Tomorrow, the beaches even be better. Tonight, after those scattered thunderstorms I mentioned go offshore, it will leave a mostly sunny day with northerly winds and temperatures up to a nice, comfortable 75 degrees. The heart of Carolina, we're going to have a nice night tonight. Sun, uh, moon will be out, and we'll see that temperature drop to the cool end of the 50s. Sunrise in the morning right at 6 o'clock exactly. Tomorrow, there it is, sunshine and a whole lot of it. For tomorrow, one of the better days we've seen. Our temperature is right in the middle 70s. Comfortable northerly winds with dry humidity. It's going to be beautiful. Five-day forecast, there's that nice day. Thursday, fair skies in the mid-70s. Friday looks like another excellent day as we begin to warm up. And here comes the weekend. And it looks like a one in three chance for a shower on this one. Looks like that variably cloudy uh, front that we saw earlier will come dragging across from the west. And we'll have a shower or two over the weekend. Other than that, looks pretty good to me. Hurricane Sebastian, huh? Hurricane Sebastian. Every year they have a wild name in there. Hope we don't make it to the S's this don't year. Don't want to go that okay, far. Okay, thank you much, Tom.
Well, the issue of where to put a statue honoring Vietnam veterans remained undecided tonight. The North Carolina Historic Commission wants the statue put in Bicentennial Plaza. Officials say the monument would be more visible there. But the group pushing for the statue says they want the memorial erected on the state capitol grounds. Well, our goal is to, to, to place this memorial in a high traffic area where it will be noticeable, be accessible to, to, to veterans and the families and friends of veterans that come here. Asai says the Bicentennial Plaza isn't what his group wants, but he admits he may have to live with it. The final decision on where to put the statue rests with the Capitol Planning Commission, a group which has no regularly scheduled meetings. Organizers estimate it'll cost $300,000 to build the statue. Well, still ahead on Eyewitness News, we'll show you the doll worth thousands and an NBA championship worth millions. Rich Brenner has this. That's right. You put that very well. You know, the uh, Philadelphia 76ers, they've got to be in hog heaven. And we'll tell you about it and show you right after this. It had been a long time coming for the Philadelphia 76ers after three trips to the finals in recent years. The Sixers finally did it. That for the first time since 1967, the Sixers won basketball's world championship, sweeping the defending world champion Los Angeles Lakers in four straight. Sixers 115, Lakers 108. Let's pick it up late in the game. Bobby Jones steals Magic Johnson's pass to Clint Richardson. Sixers pulled it within three, 95-92. They at one time trailed by 16. Moses Malone misses, but he taps the Rebound to Andrew Tony. Tony finds the range. 102 101. Lakers lead down to one. Under three minutes to play. Jabbar, Jabbar puts the Lakers back up by three. 106 to 103. Then the Sixers come back and tie it. 106 all. Julius Irving steals Jabbar's pass. He goes coast to coast. 106 all. A little over a minute later, the Sixers get the lead for good. Who else? Dr. J again on the full court break. A three point play. 109 107. Philadelphia. But wait a minute, the doc is not finished yet. This jumper is going to make it 111 to 108. Now here is the coup de grace. Bobby Jones will get the ball to Maurice Cheeks. There it is to Cheeks. Cheeks will get it over to Moses Malone. Malone thunders it through. Sixers win at 115-108 for the Sixers. This one was worth waiting for. <laughs> Well, you know, I know, I know tomorrow, uh, everybody will be wondering whether we can repeat. <laughs> so, you know, we're not going to let that get to us. I think our greatest joy comes from the work itself. And our greatest time and our greatest happiness is when we're on the court. When we step off, you know, we're just another bunch of working guys who have finished work. And uh, that's where we're going to stay. We're not going to get big-headed, we're not going to get overconfident, and we're not going to get crazy. I'm not going to get crazy. Well, one of America's greatest sports heroes died yesterday. Former heavyweight champion Jack Dempsey died in New York of natural causes, that at the age of 87. Dempsey was the champion who attracted boxing's first $5 million gates, and that was before radio and TV and inflation. And this action right here is from that famous long count fight with Gene Tunney at Chicago's Soldier Field in 1927. Well over 100,000 fans paid their way in to see this one. It was really after this fight when Dempsey didn't regain the heavyweight championship that he did retire from boxing. Jack Dempsey, boxing's Manasseh Mahler, dead at the age of say, 87. You know, baseball may be a team game, but it's also one of those team sports which allows every individual, when given the chance, to shine on his own. Now take the Atlanta Braves and National League most valuable player Dale Murphy and last night's 10-2 win over the Pittsburgh Pirates. Murphy not only leads the league in home runs and RBIs, he is also a heck of a fielder. Look at that grab right out there in the first inning, taking extra bases away from Billy Madlock. Claude L. Washington, a great night. Four for four. Here is a two-run triple. This will bring in Rafael Ramirez and Glenn Hubbard. It was the Braves' first two runs of the game. Brett Butler is going to come up with a triple. Brett Butler, the young former Durham Bull. But the guy here was Phil Negro. He is going to do a belly flop slide in this game also. Negro was the winning pitcher, also passed Cy Young as the 11th all-time strikeout leader. The good belly flop slide, Bob Horner, a big three-run homer. Another athlete who stands out when he takes the field is Campbell University's Orville Peterson, who finished second in the NCAA Division I decathlon championships down in Houston. He finished second to Indiana's Kerry Zimmerman. A tough break for Peterson, the event which cost him the high jump, 
A high jump right here now in this action, he did it at 6-6 very easily. His worst jump all year was 6-9. Yesterday, he could only clear 6-5. It cost him the championship. Well, this past Friday night, we brought you a story about the youngest driver in the world, 600 field, 18-year-old Bobby Hillen from Midland, Texas. Well, here's an update on Bobby Hillen Jr., who had himself quite an afternoon in car number eight. Hillen was the 40th and final qualifier for the World 600. Of the 41 starters, Hillen ended up finishing 11th, and in the process, felt he learned a lot. During this race, I gained more experience than I have probably in all my races put together. I really learned a lot, and I gained a lot of self-confidence for later, in, later years, you know, because I really have it in my heart now that I know, I know I can be a winner. Helen's no real stranger to good racing. His dad, who won't directly sponsor him, did sponsor Al Unser for the past three years. Helen's crew chief, the veteran Harry Hyde, doesn't hold back on his praise for Bobby Hillen. I couldn't be more proud of him. I think he's the best thing I saw come along, 18 years old, since I've been racing. Now, interesting story there. He qualified at Charlotte Friday morning and then flew back to graduation. Friday Got that night. sheepskin. Okay, thank you, Rich. Well, these are some of the stories we're working on for 11 o'clock. Some pot growers in Harnett County are being left out in the cold. Tonight, we'll look at how this illegal crop is suffering this year. And Catherine Walters begins a three-part series on desegregation. In the market for a $6,500 doll, a limited edition porcelain replica of Marilyn Monroe arrived at Gorgeous Dolls in Northgate Mall this afternoon, complete with real mink and real diamonds. Now, the 16-inch doll was escorted to Durham this afternoon by an armored truck. It's one of three collector dolls the store has bought from World Dolls in New York City. So who would pay $6,500 for such a doll? Well, store owner David Hearn says he's already gotten calls from two people who might like to buy it. We'll just order a dozen or so. <laughs> and that's Eyewitness News at 6. We'll be back at 11. Until then, for Tom Rich, the entire crew, I'm Larry Stogner. Good evening. <laughs>